Good morning and welcome to Emerson Unitarian Universalist Congregation. <clears throat> we are so glad you are here today. My name is Leslie McLean. I'm a member of the congregation. I'm a part of the worship team. I am a part of the Emerson Choir. <clears throat> and I am a member of the leadership development team. I'll be the worship associate for today. I offer a special welcome to those of you joining us for the first time, either in person or online. We're grateful you're here and look forward to getting to know you. As a Unitarian Universalist congregation, we affirm the inherent worth and dignity of each and every person through anti-racism, anti-oppression, support for the LGBTQ plus communities, working for reproductive justice, voting rights, and other issues as the world calls us to side with love. We seek to build a beloved community, not only here, but in our surrounding area. If you are viewing online, we hope to meet you soon in the future. For everyone here in person, you are invited to join us for social time following the service for light refreshments in the fellowship hall. The fellowship is on the first floor down this hall behind the sanctuary. Then at 1125, please join us for religious exploration and small group activities. There will be worship reflections here in the sanctuary and additional offerings are listed in your order of service. Today, our guest speaker is Jeffrey Ward Jacoby, who has been coming to Emerson since 2016. He is in the choir, musicians of Emerson, the worship team, and the story troupe. He recently published his first novel, Glimmer Mountain, A Tale of Hope, which is available in the Emerson Library. His interest in helping others led him to become a massage therapist in 2001. He has a great appreciation for nature and animals, especially dogs. He enjoys writing, cooking, singing, gardening, and folklore. He lives right here in Cobb County with his partner, Bruce King, and their rescue dog, Bailey. Now we pause to light our chalice as a symbol of our shared Unitarian Universalism faith. Our chalice lighter this morning is Cora Pierre Jean Pierre. The chalice words today are from Alexander Calder. Imagination and knowledge are in a constant dance with imagination always leading. Now in the spirit of love and the beloved community, let's greet and welcome each other to this new day as, as we share our congregational affirmation, we need not think alike to love alike. And in the spirit of love and the beloved community, let's greet and welcome each other to this new day. Those in the sanctuary, feel free to move around to offer greetings, and for those online, please use the chat to introduce yourself.
Well, that was a very healthy greet your neighbor. I'm glad there was a lot of greeting going on out there. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And thank you for joining us today, everyone here in the sanctuary, as well as everyone online. I'll just maybe shout out to Jim and March and Lee, maybe, if you guys are watching. Good to see you guys. Thanks for joining us. We do have a very healthy online community, you know. Um, and I'm so glad you're all, we're all here to, to, as we talk about why it is so important to have a healthy imagination. And I just have to say a quick thank you to Leslie McLean and uh, Christy Ogle and Noel, Noel Gorwick for helping with the service today. Thanks also to Greg Hebert. He's going to be supplying our anthem today, which is going to be really nice in a little while. Uh, thanks to the AV team, Keith and um, our hymn singers, and to uh, Peter Golbitz for uh, supplying some additional music. And as always, our fantastic music coordinator, Bruce King. So the following words are the best description I found to introduce this topic. The statement, imagination is the first step of invention, is often considered to be true. Imagination is the ability to create mental images or concepts that are not immediately present to our senses. It involves the capacity to think creatively and envision possibilities beyond what currently exists. In the context of invention and innovation, imagination plays a crucial role in several ways. Imagination is a key factor that sets us apart from computers, robots, and artificial intelligence. It's the ability to think the impossible and to come up with innovative solutions to the challenges we face. By using our imaginations, we can create something new that wasn't possible before. This potential to imagine different futures is critical for entrepreneurs and innovators who are looking to come up with meaningful solutions to everyday problems. Recent studies have found that harnessing imagination can lead to creative problem solving, improve productivity, and better decision making. In addition, creativity can help to reduce stress and increase wellness. Embracing imagination can create a culture of innovation and collaboration that can lead to more successful outcome. Imagination is an invaluable resource. And now, uh, our, as our hymn singers join us, please rise in body or in voice as we join together in song for our opening hymn, which is number 188, Come, Come, Whoever You Are. Good morning, everybody. Am I there? Hello, hello. You hear me? Yeah, there you go. All right. So we're going to divide ourselves into four groups. Everyone the furthest from me, you're number one. Let me see number one over your head. Do you know who you are? Yeah, yeah. All right, the next group is number twos. Peace, brother and sister. Section three, more than peace. <laughs> and section four, twice the peace. <laughs> all right, so what we're going to do is we're all going to sing the song together once through. And then section one is going to be led by our own Claudia. So pay attention to Claudia, number ones. Number twos, you're going to check out Mary. Number three, Lisa is your leader. And number four, you have Miss Christy and others. <laughs> now, once you finish your round, we'll all sing it three times as a round. So once together, you'll start your round and you'll sing it three times through. When you're done singing three times through, you're going to return to hum, hum.
Now we pause and reflect on matters of the heart. For this morning's ritual, we have water and we have river stones. The stones are smooth and the stones have weight. They're indicative of both life's pleasures and times of ease, as well as life's burdens and times of heaviness. The water receives these stones with ease and calmness. Each week, you are invited to write a joy, sorrow, or concern in this book that resides on the clear podium in the back, or email it to pastoralcare at emersonuu.org to be read. If you're online, we invite you to recreate this at home. You place a stone in a bowl of water to honor what is in your heart. We begin by placing three stones, one in honor of the Cherokee and Muscogee nations of indigenous peoples who lived here before us. The second, for those wrongly enslaved here who labored on this land. And the third, for all those hurting in current conflicts across our globe. Within our community, we have two items to share. The first is a joy from Art Wickman. Art Wickman shares that his son, Aaron Wickman, and Aaron's partner, Randy Schrodel, were married this past Saturday. The, newly, the newlyweds will be living just a stone's throw from Emerson and may one day accept Art's invitation to come to church. It could happen. And from Susan Tomachek, Joe is currently back in a nursing rehab facility in Woodstock. Visitors would be welcome for a short visit with Joe. Drop him a note, snail mail, please. Please send thoughts, wishes, and prayers for his recovery. Contact Susan via text for location of rehab. It's difficult for her to talk on the phone. Joe misses his Emerson community. In thankful awareness, let's say the Buddhist prayer of loving kindness. Please read the words with me that are printed in the order of service. May we all be filled with loving kindness. May we all be free from harm and suffering. May we all be well in body, heart, and mind. May we all be at peace. Blessed be. Good morning. My name is Mary Miller, and I'm a member of the Social Justice Leadership Team, the Choir, and the Activities Committee. We have come to the time of sharing our basket, and this month we are supporting Access Reproductive Care Southeast, or ARC. One way we put our prayer of loving kindness into action is by partnering with organizations who work to bring about love and kindness and justice in the world. All donations, unless otherwise marked, go 50% to our partner organization and 50% to Emerson. Today we have with us Zoe Bambara, the Community and Volunteer Engagement Coordinator for ARC Southeast. She's going to share a little of what ARC does and we'll be in room 103 at second hour to give us more in-depth information and talk about ways Emerson and Art can work together to support reproductive justice. Good morning, everyone. I am so honored to be here today. I grew up in the church, um, haven't been in years, but I told my aunt where I was coming today, and she was like, well, that's one way to get you back. So <laughs> um, I'm really grateful to be here today. Um, so I'm going to do like a little quick introduction of what ARC is. Access Reproductive Care Southeast is a reproductive justice organization that provides funding and logistical support to ensure Southerners receive safe and compassionate reproductive care, including abortion services. We serve six states in the Southeast. We are the biggest abortion fund in the Southeast. Um, we provide logistical support as in airfare, the cost of abortion services, Anything that our callers need, we do our very best to provide. 
Through education and leadership development, we build power in communities of color to abolish stigma and restore dignity and justice. We also, have a, we also do mutual aid throughout, our, um, throughout the six states that we cover. Um, and we have a Plan B program, um, a free Plan B program. So every, we have outposts throughout the states, and every kit, Plan B kit, includes free Plan Bs, um, condoms, lube, and other reproductive justice needs. Um, and it's free. Um, we pass them out at events. We pass them out at different um, schools and things like that. So I'm really happy to be here, and I hope you come and see me to learn more about ARC. So yeah, thank you. Well, this is the time of the service when we share a story. So I've got a story for all ages. So would the young and young at heart like to come down and hear a story? I'm going to have some help today from uh, Christy and Noel. We're going to be telling a story today about a lady who can hear thoughts. Thank you, for, thank you for joining us today for this story. So like I said, this, this story is called The Lady Who Heard Thoughts. There once was a lady who heard thoughts. Her name was Miss Alexander, and she lived in a very large, ornate Victorian house just outside of a small town. A small terrier named Presto, who had once belonged to her brother, was her only companion. There he is. <laughs> she had enjoyed living there for many years because of the peace she found there. Her house was just far enough away from the rest of the town to allow her to escape the constant chatter of other people's thoughts. Over the years, however, the small town had grown and houses were starting to be built all around her. And now, even when she was alone in her house, the thoughts of others began drifting into her mind and it seemed there was no escaping them. She sent word out to the town that she would travel for one year to find a new place to live and while she was gone, she would need someone to look after her house. Whomever she chose would have to live in the house, take care of it, and presto, and upon her return, if the house was as she left it, she would give it to the caretaker as a gift. She, she knew exactly what type of person she was looking for. The saying in her family had always been, if your thoughts match your words, if your words match your deeds, once your deeds have occurred and they meet someone's needs, you are to be trusted, trusted indeed. The first candidate was a pretty girl who smiled and nodded as Miss Alexander showed her through the house. This is the parlor, she said. It's full of the furniture and precious things I've collected over the years. Everything in here must be dusted once a week. She paused here and looked at the girl who was still smiling and nodding, but Miss Alexander heard her thoughts. Once a week? 
No way. If she's gone a year, I'll just wait until the day before she comes back and dust then. She'll never know the difference. <laughs> Abruptly, Miss Alexander entered the interview and showed her the door. She couldn't believe she hadn't gotten the job and wondered what had happened. Next was a young man. As Miss Alexander told him, My brother was a, ma a magician, but he's been gone for several years now, and all I have left to remember him is his dog, Presto. He is precious to me and must sleep in your bed with you every night right next to you. <laughs> the young man smiled at her and said he would be fine with that. But Miss Alexander heard his thoughts. Sleep with a dog? No way. I'll put that little mud out in the garden at night. It's fenced in so he won't get away. She'll never know the difference. He was shown out as well. The young man was stunned. No one turns me down, he thought. At last, there was a young lady named Samantha whose thoughts were always in agreement with every one of Miss Alexander's demands about the house. But what really convinced her was when she introduced the young lady to, to her dog, Presto, and mentioned that he must sleep with her every night. Miss Alexander heard Samantha, Samantha's thoughts. What an adorable dog. Look at that. He's so adorable. I'll love snuggling with Presto. He'll keep me company in this big house and keep me warm at bed at night. Mm -hmm. The very last one was a nice young man named James. As she showed James around the garden, he was obviously impressed. Miss Alexander heard James' thoughts. This is the most spectacular garden I've ever seen. I'd love to take care of this garden and keep it just as it is. It all looks so perfect. Miss Alexander decided to divide the job. She asked Samantha to take care of the house and, and her beloved terrier Presto, and James was asked to take care of the outside garden and grounds. Whichever part of my property looks best to my eye when I return in a year will determine who gets the house. They saw each other every day in the yard when Samantha would bring Presto outside for his daily romps through the garden. Even though they were rivals for the final prize of receiving the house, there was a strange energy between the two of them that neither could deny. Sometimes when they spoke, they felt very awkward, and other times it seemed like they would just keep talking forever and they'd just known each other their entire lives. One day, Samantha had to admit that to herself that she was beginning to really like James. James awoke that same day having similar thoughts, and they both looked forward to seeing each other at the beautiful old Victorian house. The year went by very quickly, and the house and garden always looked perfect. The night before Miss Alexander returned, however, several of the young men and women who were passed over for the caretaking job got together and hatched a terrible plan. They decided to go to the house that night and make the house look uncared for. The, the vandals scaled the walls and dug haphazard holes in the garden. They then rubbed soap all over the shining windows, and during the rest of the night, the soap dripped down, fogging the glass and choking the shrubs below the windows, turning them shriveled and brown. Samantha woke up suddenly before sunrise the next morning, realizing that Presto wasn't next to her in bed. He was gone. She went out into the dark garden with a flashlight and was shocked to see holes dug all over the garden. Even worse, she saw that poor little Presto had fallen into one of them. Oh, poor Presto. She scooped him up and rushed him off to the emergency vet. James wanted to be at the house before Miss Alexander got home, but when he got there, however, the midday sun shone on the filmy, soaped-up windows, and he was stunned to see the healthy box what's now brown and dead-looking. Samantha was just getting back from the vet with Presto, whose fur was still dirty from the hole and now had one leg completely wrapped up in a white bandage. What happened to Presto and the windows? James asked Samantha. Where did all those holes come from? asked Samantha at the same moment. Neither of them had an answer, so they just stared in horror at the sight. That was when Miss Alexander returned. What on earth happened to my house? You were supposed to keep the windows clean, Samantha. And look at my garden, James. And that was when she saw Presto, dirty and bandaged, squirming in Samantha's arms. What happened to my dear Presto? She asked as she snatched the terrier away from her. James and Samantha both wanted to explain what had happened, but they just didn't know. So they stared at Miss Alexander, then looked at each other and back at her, struggling to think of something to say. Get out, both of you, right now. I've found an ideal place to move, but not until I've found someone suitable to take care of my house. It's obviously neither of you. James and Samantha, feeling defeated, left the house and heard the gate slam behind them. 
In the weeks that followed, Miss Alexander kept asking herself how she could have been so wrong about those two. Because she listened to the thoughts, everything seemed to be good. I was so sure one of them would be perfect for this house, she said to her dog as she changed his bandage. How did I get it so wrong, presto? Shockingly, the terrier responded to her question. Aww. Don't be so rough on yourself. You made the right decision. You can talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've never hit it. Remember the other day you asked, what's on that tree? And I said, Burk. I'm so glad you can speak. Please tell me more about James and Samantha. What happened? Both of them truly love this house. Samantha treated me like a king, as all dogs should be treated. Every day while you were gone, it was the others that did the bad things, the ones that had rubbed you the wrong way. I heard them in the garden at night. I ran very bravely to stop them, but I fell in a hole. <laughs> How's your leg? Oh, it's feeling much better. Miss Alexander went off to find the young caretakers after the, these revelations that Presto shared with her and discovered them coming out of a, of a church while bells were ringing and their families lining the paths, having clearly just gotten married. She stopped them and said, Your thoughts matched your words. Your words matched your deeds. Since you said what you meant and you have good intent, you may live in my house. You belong there indeed. They were so thrilled to hear this, and Miss Alexander heard their thoughts. That beautiful house, we're so lucky to get to live there, and we'll raise a big family and be so happy there. So, they did, and Miss Alexander and Presto moved to the new house. This one was deep in the woods, much further away from the thoughts of others, where she could finally find some peace, she thought. Although, it seemed peace might be hard to come by after all. Once Presto started talking, he rarely stopped, and he was quite willing to give his opinions on just about everything. Gaza, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Miss Alexander didn't really mind, though. She was thrilled to hear all about his adventures with her magician brother and so many more. She loved her friend dearly, and with no neighborhood chatter to get in the way, she listened to him happily and never asked for quiet again. All right. Thank you. All right, let's stand up and sing our song of dedication. And now we pause for a moment for a moment of prayer and meditation. Please find a comfortable position to sit in, have soft eyes, and rest your hands comfortably in your lap. Take a deep breath in. Hold. And exhale. Hold. Inhale. Hold. Exhale, hold, natural breath. From George Bernard Shaw, imagination is the beginning of creation. You imagine what you desire, you will what you imagine, and at last, you create what you will. Inhale, 
hold. Exhale, hold. Natural breath. From Pablo Picasso, everything you can imagine is real. Inhale, hold. Exhale, hold. Inhale, hold. Exhale, natural breath. From Terence McKenna, the imagination is the golden pathway to everywhere. to your imagination We'll begin with a spin Traveling in the world of my creation What we'll see will defy explanation If you want to view Simply take a view and see it. Anything you want to do it. Want to change the world, there's nothing to it. There is no life I know to compare with your imagination. Living there. Thank you very much, Greg and Bruce. I, I really appreciate it. That was a very, very nice song. Beautiful. Thank you so much. 
So do you want to change the world? There's nothing to it. As the song says, it's all within your grasp. It's all within your imagination. If you can think it, if you can imagine something, then you're one step closer to making it happen. Creativity is at the heart of imagination, so the best thing to do is to feed that part of yourself. Although some people have told me sad things about being an adult and sort of accepting the fact that they aren't creative or no longer have an imagination, but I'm here to say that you can always be creative. You just have to stoke your creative fires, and for that you need fuel. And so how do we fuel our creativity? I really appreciate the way Thomas Neal breaks this down. He says there are three eyes to creativity. Number one, inspiration. Number two, imagination. And number three, ideas. All people can be inspired, but no artist can be created without it. Inspiration is the floodgate opening, the kettle placed on the fire. You not only have to have it, you have to feed on it with a hunger so deep you want more and more and more of it. It may come visually, audibly, from a feel, from a friend, from travel, from an experience, or even just a glance. But it has one purpose creatively, to feed your imagination. I really love this explanation of having to, uh, and the part where he talks about having to feed on inspiration with a deep hunger. There have been times in my life when I've gotten so lost in a project of some sort and have worked on it for hours in an almost obsessive way. I've also had things that I've gotten interested in throughout my life, and maybe this has happened to you. I got interested to a degree that it was almost all I could think about, and all of my time and energy would be put into making more time for that thing, whatever it was at that time. Some interests have lasted a few months, and others have been lifelong interests, but I think that's what Thomas Neal was talking about. If you're going to get into something, anything, don't bother doing it halfway. Dive in feet first and see where it takes you. If you've gotten to that point with anything that you're putting time and energy into it, there is something there for you. Anything that kind of piques your curiosity or your interest. And if you find yourself thinking about it for any kind of significant period of time, then there's most definitely going to be something contained in there that will fuel your creativity. Then you're off to those three I's, inspiration, imagination, and ideas. Whenever we are inspired by anything, it's our imagination that helps take it, help us to take it to the next level. Once an idea has been introduced into our imagination, it's in there forever. My anatomy teacher in school told me to never worry about remembering all the muscles, origins, insertions, and actions. She always said that if you've heard something even one time, it's in your brain. You have that knowledge, and it just takes inspiration to help you to find it when you need it. Being inspired is like having a key to it, unlock just the right idea at the right time. How many times can you recall hearing a song, or maybe smelling something, like a special scent, or seeing a, a familiar face, or some, a face that reminds you of somebody, and that suddenly brings to mind an idea that you, you remember that you were introduced to a really long time ago? It's all in there, but it's the retrieval that gets tricky. And that's the reason why it's so important to surround yourself with inspiration. The keys to the imagination kingdom are all there in inspiration. So if nature inspires you, then walk around the woods, often. Or just walk around in your backyard. Bruce and I are very inspired by our garden, and we both find ourselves out there wandering around often. The things that inspire you may be different, but I feel like it's important to vary your inspiration. I do what I can to discover new things whenever possible. It becomes kind of tempting to stay within the boundaries of what you found inspires you in the past, and that is a great way to be inspired, but you can surprise yourself sometimes. It may be something unexpected that unlocks that part of your imagination that's been in there for a long time, just waiting to be uncovered and polished and perfected. There are many ways to be inspired, and only you may know what that is, but being open to the new stuff is a great way to be inspired in a new way. All of, this, all of this inspiration that fuels our imagination may result in ideas, and ideas are always a result of those first two things. I've chosen to focus my talk today, however, about imagination specifically. It seems that some don't value it, or as I've already said, accept that theirs will just kind of slip away. So I'm here to say that it's a precious gift and that doing whatever you can to feed it and keep it healthy, and it will take you to places in your life you never dreamed existed. In the late 70s, Kate Wilhelm's novel called Where Late the Sweet Birds Sang was released. And although it's a work of fiction, it gave me multiple revelations about the importance of imagination. It's what, that book is what really inspired me to write this sermon. In the story, the world as we know it has come to an end. Nuclear fallout as well as environmental factors have rendered all survivors, which there are not many, as sterile, 
So the only chance the human race to con continue is through cloning. They perfect this process and begin to produce people in this way with the idea that at some point, humans would be able to reproduce in the traditional way again. This takes quite a while, and in the meantime, the elders and non-clone members of this small community were getting much older, dying off, and the clones they had created were running almost everything in this small society. The clones decide that cloning is a far superior process than natural procreation, and they change the laws of the community to reflect that. Eventually, they began to run into uh, some uh, run short on their supplies, and they decide to send a small group out to the near city to see what they can scavenge. Once this small group leaves the safety of the community and their fellow clones, however, they are lost. Every clone has the most outstanding trait of whomever they were cloned from, but little else. They each have one thing they can do and cannot even imagine doing anything else. They really can't imagine anything. It seems to be the most problematic thing that they're lacking. They have scientists in their labs working on cloning and other advanced things, but if any of their computers fail, they can't even start to know how to repair it. The small group that leaves the compound becomes disoriented and filled with new fears and anxieties. They struggle to find their way and barely make it back. Once they've returned, they're all altered greatly, having nightmares and finding it difficult to relate now to their fellow clones. One of them is so altered by her experience, they actually banish her to a small house outside the compound to live by herself because her individuality is too disturbing to the rest. She becomes obsessed with art, creating art pictures and paintings and with nature and embracing the woods and the world outside the clone compound. Another one of the group who is deeply affected as well, as he, and he visits her often, although the community has forbidden it. Against all odds, they conceive a child, and the mother raises the boy in secret. She raises him with her perception of the world. This boy eventually becomes the group's savior, being the only one among them to be able to deal with the things outside of the compound. He can tell stories, survive in the wilderness, and can think about all sorts of things, not just one thing. They have a love-hate relationship with him because they see how much better prepared to survive in the world he is than they are. Although he's not a clone, his abilities and, mostly, his imagination make him a crucial part of their survival. The ideas in this book support the idea that keeping a healthy imagination is not only healthy and important, but as vital as oxygen may be to the ongoing survival of the human race. My favorite author, Stephen King, has said many times when he gets the question, where do you get your ideas for your stories from? And he famously replies that there is no specific place for ideas. He says ideas come from everywhere. He never knows, but the thing that works for him is to pay attention to the ideas that won't go away. The ideas that you release and they come trotting back to you over and over again no matter how many times you stop playing with them in your head. Those are the ideas that will grip your imagination. The other thing he likes to talk about is combining two ideas. If he has two ideas simmering away in his imagination and they suddenly seem like they can be combined, then he starts writing a story. I was reminded of Stephen King's explanation of idea origins when I got the idea to write uh, for the book that I wrote. When I got the idea for my story, it came from the oddest place. Nothing I would have ever expected. I mean, do you think that you could have been, ever be inspired to write a book while you are raking leaves? Probably not. I was raking leaves one day in late fall of 2015, was almost done. And I had a pile that was in the street. I'd been picking up and taking in the backyard, and I came back with my, my big bu container to fill up. And I thought, oh, I think I'm almost done. And I came around just to see it, thinking I'm almost, I'm almost done. I just want to size up what I had left. And I saw what was left in the street was this, was this little pile. And the bulk of the pile was kind of looked like a mouse body. And then there was a, some leaves that kind of curled up behind it that looked like a mouse tail. And it looked like a mouse. But in my head, I said to myself, hmm. That looks like a glimmer mouse. And I said, what, a glimmer mouse? What is that? What on earth is a glimmer mouse? It's just a pile of leaves that looks like a mouse. Still that idea, that name, glimmer mouse, was the key that unlocked something in my imagination. The name stuck with me for days. I found that name, or that title, kept returning to my consciousness and was unsure why, especially since I did not know what a glimmer mouse was. When I told Bruce about this name stuck in my head and asked him if he had ever heard of one before, I thought maybe it was a thing, I just, you know, just was rattling around in my head and I'd forgotten what it was. He said he'd never heard of one, but maybe I should write a story to explain what a glimmer mouse was, if, you know, since I'd been thinking about it so much. And suddenly Stephen King's idea came to mind and I wondered if there was a story there somewhere, a story that could satisfy that part of my brain that wouldn't let it go. I thought about what a glimmer usually makes me think of, 
And immediately, a glimmer of hope was the first thing I thought of, and the idea that a magical mouse with a special tail that could somehow bring hope to people with his tail came to mind. I had already been brainstorming the ideas for a dog story based on the two dogs we had at the time, an Italian greyhound named Twiggy and a German wire hair pointer named Kindle. Once I combined the two ideas, I was off and running and didn't stop writing almost every day until my story was done. And finally, my imagination was satisfied for a while. I got the idea for the story I told today for the kid's, uh, kid's story when I wondered what, one day what would happen if someone could actually hear thoughts. I think it's a great example of an opportunity to use your imagination. To enjoy this story, we have to use our imagination. Because, I mean, if you heard it and you could say, no one can actually hear thoughts. Or you could actually say, dogs can't talk. Or you know, the most unbelievable part might be, no one would actually give a Victorian house away. <laughs> <laughs> but if you can use your imagination and wonder what it would be like if these things could happen, you can enjoy the story. And you're not lying to yourself if you let yourself enter this world where a lady can hear thoughts, where a dog can talk. You're entering the world of imagination. Usually when I write stories, I also don't really have much in mind other than telling a fun story. But the thing I've noticed about stories is that often the ones that I enjoy reading can have an interesting subtext that was possibly never really intended at all. Jack Finney, after writing his book, The Body Snatchers, which became Invasion of the Body Snatchers, was really surprised when some were saying that he was clearly making references to the Cold War or a warning against communism or McCarthy eerie thinking within the story. But he claimed that he just wanted to tell this story about these pods that come from outer space without a craft of any sort and what they might do when they got here. He wondered where all that other stuff came from. So these ideas that come from the imagination can inspire all sorts of thoughts in others' imagination. There is no way to know how much some ideas can fuel the imagination of others. Immanuel Kant said, we do not see the world as it is, but only as our instruments will allow. If our instruments are a direct reflection of how much knowledge we have, then this is an excellent reason why knowledge is so important. To find out as much as you can that exists, to travel to as many places as you can reach, to expose yourself to as many things as you possibly can. Even if it's stuff you think you may not like, there may be something to be learned from almost any experience. And the more you put into your brain bank, the more material your imagination has to work with. You may not even realize it, and you don't even have to. You just throw all that stuff into your brain, reading, seeing, talking, experiencing, listening, and watching. And who knows what your imagination may concoct with all those ingredients you've been feeding it over time. The more, the better. Everything that's in there was a result of something you experienced before, so the more, the better. If you think this is true, as I do, then it's an excellent reason to read to your children and to read to yourself. If we are only able to interact with the world in a way that is a direct reflection of whatever we've been exposed to in the past, then hearing stories about all sorts of things will expand your reflection. My mother read to me when I was a kid. Thank you, Mom. And it inspired me to want to read because she always made it fun and I loved the stories she would read to us. Roald Dahl was my favorite. Charlie and the Great Glass Elevator and James and the Giant Peach were at the top of my favorites. Yes, those are, good. those are good ones. I love all sorts of stories, but fantasy and horror stories are my favorites. Poe and Ray Bradbury were my teen faves, but science fiction is next on the list, and that genre in particular has fired the imaginations of inventors and entrepreneurs for decades. Jules Verne in particular inspired many with his stories of the fantastic. American inventor Simon Lake became obsessed with the idea of undersea travel after reading 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. This, this obsession turned Lake into the father of the modern submarine in 1898. Without Verne's fiction, it might not have happened. The helicopter was invented by Igor Sikorsky after reading Jules Verne's book, The Clipper of the Clouds. It fired his imagination, and now we have the helicopter. There were also illustrations in that book that helped him to make an actual, real, practical machine. Sikorsky often spoke of his appreciation for the works of Jules Verne and said, anything that one can imagine, another can make real, and he did. Liquid-fueled rockets were invented and launched on March 16th, and after Robert Goddard read H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, he said that Wells' idea of interplanetary travel gripped my imagination tremendously. Martin Cooper, in charge of research and development at Motorola, credits several Star Trek technologies that led to the invention of the first mobile phone in the early 1970s. And can't you just see Captain Kirk and his team on, on some unknown planet with their communicators? 
So because of Star Trek, we all have a communicator with us probably right now. And how about the World Wide Web? When Tim Berners-Lee read 2001 A Space Odyssey author Arthur C. Clarke's description of a global interconnected telephone network that gained sentience in the short story Dial F for Frankenstein, it inspired his imagination to create something that we all use every day. Yes, the World Wide Web started as just inspiration, then imagination, and then an idea. So yes, it seems that having a healthy imagination is healthy indeed not only for yourself, but for others who may be exposed to the ideas born in there. Nurture your imagination, and if it's been a while, then seek inspiration. Start with what's familiar, and then try something new, something maybe a friend wants to do, or something you've always wondered if it'd be fun or not. Who knows what your imagination might cook up afterward? Try seeing where Ginger is off to next and travel to a place you've never been to, or maybe like an escape room, or zip lining, or Dungeons and Dragons, or pickleball, that's a really big one right now. And if you get really desperate, you might want to just pick up a rake and start freaking some leaves. I mean, that's, that's work for me. <laughs> so yes, there is no life I know to compare with pure imagination. Living there, you'll be free if you truly wish to be. Thank you for listening. And now, please rise in body and vo or in voice for our closing hymn, number 1007, in the teal hymnal, there's a river flowing in my soul. again, hymn singer. It's very nicely done. Imagination is a topic that many great thinkers have discussed. So I'm going to close with just a couple of quotes I couldn't manage to find any place else for. First of all, from George Lucas, you can't do it unless you can imagine it. From Alexander Calder, imagination and knowledge are in a constant dance with imagination always leading. Carl Sagan, said, imagination will often carry us to worlds that never were, but without it, we go nowhere. And one more thing, the next time you meet someone new, imagine that you can hear their thoughts like Miss Alexander in the story today. If you're imagining kind or unkind things, I think people can tell. 
and all starts inside your head, it all starts your imagination. And just remember, if your words match, if your thoughts match your words, if your words match your deeds, you are to be trusted, trusted indeed. All right, is my chalice extinguisher ready to come up? Nope. All right, I think I'm good. <laughs> okay, gone to do other things. As our chalice is extinguished this morning, we extinguish this chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts and out into the world until we are together again. So I have a couple of announcements. Um, first, importantly, next Sunday, the 31st, Reverend Christina will return to the pulpit and we will be celebrating Easter and our flower communion, which has always been a very popular tradition here at Emerson. So you won't want to miss that. Please join us. Secondly, in your order of service, you have probably seen a notice that says, Emerson is seeking a vice president. Each year, the leadership development team creates a slate of candidates for various positions at Emerson. These are the positions the congregation votes on at the annual meeting in the spring, and they're for the Board of Trustees, Conflict Resolution, Endowment Committee, and Leadership Development. Many of you have served or are currently serving in various capacities at Emerson including as a member of one of the elected committees, working with children and youth, teaching RE, being part of the hospitality team, and many more. Your service is always deeply appreciated and it what helps keep Emerson such a vibrant community. This year we have another list of great candidates that we'll be presenting to you at the annual meeting later in the spring. However, we're still missing one position. We still need someone to take on the role of vice president for one year to be in training to then be the next president of the board beginning in July 2025. Along with this insert, there is a QR code that you can click on to see the roles of both the vice president and the president. And I encourage you to look at these and think about the possibilities this could be your next great opportunity here at Emerson. If you're interested or simply have questions, please contact any of us on the leadership development team. That's Colleen Radbill, Melanie LeMay, Wen Scow, or me, and we're happy to speak with you. Um, and Eric has an announcement that he is going to make in connection with this before we conclude. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Eric Scow, I'm our, uh, our treasurer this year um, for, for Emerson on the Board of Trustees. And so um, the, uh, you know, a few things that are in the, in the bylaws um, that, that you may or may not be aware of. So one, one thing is that, you know, for our board officers, we, uh, we elect our board officers every year at our annual meeting. Normally those are nominated by the uh, the leadership development committee, but anybody is always willing to uh, to put forth themselves, you know, themselves or others as a as a nominee, if they're interested in that. And please um, just talk to any board member if you're interested in doing that. Um, and you know that that our you know obviously the members of the board are are members of the congregation, um, and the other things that are in the in the bylaws are that. Uh, no member of the board will serve on the board for more than six years. Um, currently, none of the members of the board have, have been on the board for, uh, for more than five years, so, so, that, so we're, we're, we're not uh, in danger of, uh, of exceeding that requirement. But then the, uh, the president, um, it says in the bylaws, is not uh, able to serve for more than three years consecutively. And our current president, George Clear, has uh, this is coming up on the end of his third year. Um, so right now, because um, we have not been able to identify someone currently yet to take the position of vice president, which is currently open, um, we are uh, George and the board have discussed the possibility of him being able to serve for a fourth year, 
um, while we bring a new person into the vice presidency role and come up to speed, and that would then involve us having a vote at the annual meeting to create a one-year exception for for that um, for that part of the bylaws. Um, but if you know if anybody has any concerns or, or would like to uh, to fill the role of of vice president, please you know as Leslie said, come see the um, leadership development committee or or member of the board, and because uh, we'd love to love to have more help on the board. Thanks. All right, so until next week when we're together again, go now in peace and take peace wherever you go.